My dad was a school leader for 30 years. He has no social media, but he knows everything that's going on because he lurks on my mom's Facebook. So what I, what I kind of try to get people to envision is using social media as a choice. So you can choose to be a disconnected leader. That's your choice. However, when you look at options and there isn't a best option, the best option is what works for you. You could be a connected leader. You could be a active engager. You could be a willing participant. So I don't care if you lurk and learn. I don't care if you're an active engager, a willing participant, but making the choice not to be a connected leader, in my opinion, my opinion is you are just not opening yourself up to an array of strategies, ideas, feedback, all that stuff that can help you be the best leader for your people. Welcome to School Leaders Project, a podcast series dedicated to helping school leaders make positive changes in their schools and communities. In every episode, we talk to extraordinary thinkers and doers about their experiments and experiences with teaching and learning. The School Leaders Project is an initiative by Toddle, your all-in-one teaching and learning platform made for teachers and by teachers. Toddle offers a truly integrated experience, so all of that big picture curriculum planning flows seamlessly into day-to-day -day instruction, assessment, reporting, and even parent communications. Toddle started as a passion project in a school that thought that teaching tech should be as innovative as teaching teams, and were now loved by more than 1,500 progressive K-12 schools all around the world. In today's episode of our podcast, we welcome Eric Scheniger to the show. We talk about digital leadership, what it means to lead in an AI future. And we also talk about the importance of branding for your school. So if you've been thinking about social media and how to move from being a lurker to being a creator, this episode's for you. I had so much fun talking with Eric, and I know you're going to love this episode. So let's jump right in. Thank you so much for being here. Cindy is great. I cannot wait to discuss leadership. Woo -woo. So I'd love for you to set the stage for our audience a bit. Um, who are you? What is the work that you do that you're passionate about? Yes. Yeah, so my name is Eric Scheninger, uh, former uh, principal, teacher, uh, non-believer in innovation and technology. And then I had my aha moment when a student told me school was like a jail and I got on Twitter. My eyes were opened and I really began to think differently about what school could and should be. So now for the past nine years, I have been working with school systems across the world on how do we fundamentally improve teaching, learning, and leadership so that we have enhanced outcomes for our learners. You've said that once or twice before, I think. I have, but I try to really <laughs> condense it because I can go on and on and on because I'm real passionate about what I do. I mean, I get to speak to large audiences, but what I really take pride in is actually getting in classrooms, getting in schools, providing targeted, timely, specific, actionable feedback to school leaders so that they can then go and model the practices we want to see and lead that change from the ground level. I love it. So today we're going to talk about a lot of different topics because you kind of span the gamut. Um, but I'd love to start with this concept of digital leadership. So in, in your perception, what does it mean to be a digital leader? Well, you know, leadership is leadership. And, and mm -hmm. here's the thing. When we hear technology or any idea that is foreign to us, we automatically think that it's new and that's going to be more work or just another mm. thing we have to do. So I really look at it from this perspective. Leadership is not telling people what to do. It's taking them where they need to be. Leadership is about action, not position, title, or power. So when we look at the fundamental elements of, you know, nobody likes to be told what to do. Mm. They want to know, hey, how do we do it? What tells us if we're successful? Where's the inherent value? How will I see that this is going to actually help me do what I already do better? The digital aspect is how technology just seamlessly supports all the different things that embody effective leadership. Modeling, uh, building capacity, transparency, 
you know, look storytelling, uh, looking at how we then can get information out in real, like anytime, anywhere with anyone we want, anyone we want, how we can use technology. I think the biggest thing when we think about the world, the world is a much smaller place. And we are not isolated anymore based on where we live geographically. I think the biggest aspect of digital leadership is how we can connect with anyone, anywhere, at any time, where we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can get the best resources right here and now. You know, there's a saying that says the smartest person in the room is the room. Digital leadership is about taking advantage and knowing that the room is this global entity that we can all tap into when we need support, when we need to ask a question. So, you know, and just looking at things like communication, uh, you know, another big facet of leadership. So I can go on and on, but the simple, what I'm trying to get at very simply is digital supports all the tenets of effective leadership that we read and research or we've seen throughout time. Beautiful. So you've kind of touched on this, but if I'm a leader looking to be more digitally savvy, is there a practice or is there a mindset that you have found that has the biggest impact in? Yeah, I think the mindset is this, is look at what you're trying to accomplish and ask yourself, can technology help me improve that task? You know, without a doubt, you will not find an effective leader who is not an effective communicator. You won't. And in this world where everyone seems to be on some type of tool, whether it's threads, Snapchat, TikTok, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, mm. Pinterest, I don't, Mastodon. I, I don't know if I've missed any of the big players, but that's where our people are. That's where your stakeholders, your parents, your community members are residing. And email snail mail websites, you know, people are not going to that information anymore. You know, mm -hmm. for me as a parent of a now college university student and a grade 11 student, I only interact with information I get from the school if I get it through SMS text messaging, because that's how I, someone that's always on the go, really want to interact. So look at those tasks. You know, when we think about timely feedback, using things like Google Forms, uh, you know, recording, you know, snippets, flipping your faculty meetings, where you're putting all that information out in short videos, but then you're using that time. The technology saves you time to have those really in-depth conversations on how do you improve teaching and learning. So again, I could go through example after example but as leaders, identify those tasks where technology will either support or directly enhance the outcome that you're looking for. Mm. This is something I'm suggesting that everybody do with AI is make a list of every task that you do and put a star next to the tasks that take you the most time and then start looking for tools that might expedite those. Like how can we make ourselves more efficient and faster and, and still get the heart of like the things that we're great at. And it's interesting, Cindy, as you talk about AI, uh, I recently wrote a post on my blog about mm. AI leaders and you, t you, you kind of really hit the nail on the head. Technology is meant to save us time. Mm -hmm. And with AI, you can go and cert ask AI for the peer reviewed research that supports the practices that you're helping your teachers implement. You can help AI draft feedback comments that then you can use to personalize feedback for your stakeholders. You can then have AI help you draft your communications and do not use that communic that AI generated uh, response at face value. What you need to do then is personalize it, but it right. does help many of us like myself who sometimes gets writer's block and don't know what to say. But, you know, AI is one of the many tools that goes back to supporting it, enhancing, making our work more efficient, more effective, so that we then can actually focus on the humanistic element of leadership. Mm. If technology can free up our time. We can be more human by providing support to our staff, by getting in classrooms, by, you know, having more deeper conversations with our communities about what 
culture, what learning should look like in 2023 and beyond? This might be too meta, but you know, across time we've used tools. So whether it's the wheel or agriculture or laundry machines, we've used technology and tools to save time and give us back that time to do the things that we love and, and that you said that make us more human. So I think if educators and leaders can take on that mindset of this is just the newest iteration of a tool, I don't know. I think that there's freedom in that. You, again, it's 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 like you're on my shoulder when I'm delivering <laughs> keynotes and plenary uh, talks. That's what I always say. I say to everyone, mm. none of this is new. Washing clothes, not new, uh, you know, and we think about, well, how does technology enhance it? Oh my goodness. Think about all the settings. Think about how we can get notifications when, when our wash is done. You know, nothing, when we look at expectations of leadership and outcomes, none of that's new. And what is new, like we're talking about is all these digital tools that right. can help us do things better. And also access to information, access to research like never before that can really help to inform our practice and make better decisions for our respective cultures. Gorgeous. We touched on history a little bit, but it, one of the concepts I really like that you talked about is this idea of the fourth industrial revolution. So it might give our audience a bit of context about that, of what exactly is this fourth industrial revolution and how should we be thinking about it? Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, I typically show an image because, you know, the brain processes images a lot faster than text. But let's look at the comparison to the first industrial revolution, mass model, you know, factories, everybody doing the same thing at the same time, same way, knowledge being confined to certain groups or people. So now, as we've seen, we've looked at through different ages, technology evolve. And, you know, we've seen moving from the industrial revolution to more of a computational age, but now in the fourth industrial revolution, which we are well into, by the way, and we're really like on the verge of going into the fifth. Don't ask me to explain that because I don't know. And I don't have to understand, be able to explain it because I can go ask Siri, Alexa, or Bard or uh, ChatGBT. But the fourth industrial revolution is sort of influenced by artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. advanced robotics, automation at scale. So when you look at those three entities, we have to ask ourselves, how are those entities impacting the world of work? And are we as leaders, is the culture of our school and organizations preparing learners for a world that no longer exists? Or right. are we preparing our kids to really think disruptively, which I define as the ability to replace conventional ideas with innovative solutions to authentic problems. When we look at AI, could be an authentic problem. We, we look at everything that's happening, and I don't want to get political, and I don't want to get too environmental, but there's a lot of challenges out there right now. And mm -hmm. technology is one conduit to help solve them, but it doesn't matter if we don't start thinking differently. If school is more something that kids just come to do school or are they actually immersed in experience where all learners get what they need, when and where they need it. So with all these changes, we can call it fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. It doesn't matter. The main point is, is how does the culture of our schools reflect the world that our students will have to live and work in? because their work is going to influence us when we are still on this planet. Yes. Well, I think what's kind of boggling a lot of people's minds right now is that it, we were prepared for automation to take over blue collar work, you know, like transportation and factories and warehouses. We were all kind of like, yeah, okay, we get it. And then all of a sudden ChatGPT comes out and it's like, oh, it's white collar work now. You know, it's, it's the writing, it's the, the service industry, it's communication. So what sectors do you see being most impacted by this technology? Ah, that, that's hard to say. <laughs> I, I'm always so impressed with how I've seen trade jobs adapt. 
Mm. And, you know, how they now are really incorporating the latest technology to be able to do what they do better. Right. And, you know, it, 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 it's so hard to really make that prediction of, of the impact that it's going to have. But, you know, the World Economic Forum every year or a couple of years will put out, you know, this is what the workforce is looking for. And they talk about those, those key competencies. So I, I think when we start to narrow it down, you know, jobs that will thrive are the ones who will be employing creative scholars, collaborative workers, active engagers, uh, reflective learners, uh, people that can self-regulate and manage their time, especially when we look at hybrid and remote workforces, but also that openness to really, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find a sector now that is not influenced by technology where they don't have right. to use, it. you know, when I run around and sell books, I got my tiny little square, you know, that piece of technology that makes it so much easier for me to just have people scan and bam, they get their books. Um, you know, technology for me is just a ubiquitous component of, of what I do. I don't really focus again, coming back to what we talked about before. I don't focus on the tool. I focus more on what is the task I have to be able to do? How can I do it well? And more importantly, how can I do it better than others? And I think that's Smart. the key that we want is there's no perfection in education and we need to become the best iteration of ourselves so that we can serve our staff and our learners. And the only way to do that is to be more proactive than reactive, if that makes sense. I don't even know if it does. No, it makes a lot of sense because I think that's the key skill that our learners need is what is the human element of this? What is the thing that I bring to the table? And what are the things that I can augment to save time for those things that I'm passionate about? And you actually didn't talk about a skill. You just talked about competencies, you know, hmm. because you talked about that humanistic element. For example, you could be competent at, I mean, sorry, you could be skilled at throwing a baseball but totally incompetent as to how to play the game of baseball. So when you think about competencies, you know, skills, knowledge, those are those elements that are there. You know, we know what the skill is. We know the knowledge. We can acquire it. We can apply it. But how does it impact our behavior? You know, how do we change our mindset? How do we, again, bring that humanistic element? So I think that one big shift is how do we start moving to focus more on developing competent learners as opposed mm. to skilled learners because skills will change you could be so skilled at working on the assembly line but the assembly line doesn't exist in many cases anymore so those transferable skills yeah. I, and I, there's a differentiation. Guy Claxton told me this too. He said, stop calling them skills. And I feel like this is the next thing I got to dig into more to well, understand not, better. Don't, don't stop talking about it. I, I think we have to look broader. Skills and right. knowledge are part of becoming competent. But mm. competencies rely on the changes in behavior, the changes in our attitude, the changes yeah. in our mindset, uh, employing an empathetic lens. I mean, there's so many other facets that mm. when you look at a rapidly changing world, again, some skills are not transferable anymore. And right. that's where we will fall victim to fourth, fifth, whatever industrial revolution we're in, if we don't focus more on competencies, because I don't even know if we know what those transferable skills are going to be. We could say they could be communication, right. we could say they're going to be creativity, but do we really know? No knowing. Well, and you brought up the World Economic Forum, which I thought it was bizarro to look at that list. And the top two skills, they said, I think it was critical and analyt analytical thinking. Like they differentiated that. And those were the top two marketable skills for the future. And I was like, I don't even know if I could explain the difference between critical thinking versus analytical thinking. Can you? Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I would refer to chat GBT to get me started. And yeah. I think that's part about being a digital leader, coming back to what we first started talking about is using the tools to develop a better understanding. But the one thing I've noticed is critical and analytical thinking have been on that list since Forever. I remember. And they just go through, sometimes they're up at the top, sometimes down lower. But when you really unpack, it's mm. different 
words that mean the same thing? I think if you're looking for a next book topic, because I was looking around for this of like, uh, is there a framework for teaching critical and analytical thinking? And Colin Seal does some work around that. He's going to come on the show. But I think that would be a really stellar thing to unpack a bit further. You know, if you're yeah, looking for a book I mean, idea. <laughs> listen, uh, the world of education is chock full of frameworks. Mm -hmm. And the idea is uh, some of the best leadership advice I can bestow is keep it as simple as possible. You know, really narrow the focus of your staff so you can do one or two things really great. And if those one or two things embody what you want your learners to be able to know and do, you know, we focused, when I was a school leader, we focused on two things. Number one, how are we challenging our learners to think, mm. which is embedded in whatever standards, whatever assessments we are taking. Number two, and probably more important, is how are our learners applying their thinking in authentic, meaningful, relevant ways? So it's that convergence of you know high levels of cognition, but also that ability to apply learning to real world problems. I mean, I think that's mm. so, so important if we want to continue to empower and motivate uh, the future gener generation makes sense it kind of brings me to one of like my favorite quote from your newest book was you say don't prepare learners for something prepare them for anything right so how do we you kind of touched a bit but is are there other things we can do to prepare learners for anything well that was a great segue because i kind of just answered that you know getting them to think increasing thinking knowing that levels mm -hmm. of thinking are going to be different for different kids just to based upon, you know, their innate abilities, what they're interested in. But, you know, when we, we think about this, this world and, you know, we can look at the past that's informed our future. I touched on a little bit in terms of the Jetsons, which was a famous cartoon back in the 1960s. And most people know what the, the show was. And the Jetsons accurately predicted things like 3D printers, tablets, smart watches, tanning beds, but they also predicted Zoom meetings, teledoc visits, online classes. Hmm. So it, 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 it's crazy. So the Jetsons kind of basically said, listen, we got to be prepared for a world that we have no idea what it's going to look like. And that's not by focusing on technology and that's not by focusing at times what might be in our standards or curriculum because that might not have immediate relevancy because students can access all that stuff right now. Right. So I, I think we have to really look at are we getting our learners to really delve more deeply into concepts? How are we getting them to show understanding? I don't like to use the term mastery because I don't know if you truly master anything. You might be really good right. at something, but I don't, but how do we get our kids to be comfortable, confident? Uh, 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 I was trying to um, tongue tie, but I think you get what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this so, like idea of lifelong learners, and it's such an overused phrase, but that is what we want. We want our kids to be able to to be curious about the world around them and to have the tools that they need to explore that curiosity and, and make their mark. Yeah. It, it's interesting you say that because I've moved away before the pandemic. I always focused on keys for college and career readiness. Oof, and, okay. And <laughs> that's what we hear all the time in circles, you know, yeah. getting our ready for university, getting them ready for the job force. But when we think about life ready, students need, need to be able to think, know, act and go those transition like skills so important the acting piece ownership of learning and that really comes back to preparing learners for anything you know do they own the process mm -hmm. you know if, if a student can't really articulate his or her understanding through writing then guess what he or she should have the opportunity to use a video audio or a drawing because again i'm not saying they don't need to be able to write 
but preparing them for anything is understanding that there is not one right way. And that's another thing that I stress to leaders is right. I don't feel there are experts. I'm not a fan of the term best practice. There are effective practices. There are knowledgeable people that can influence your work. But the true experts are those that actually have to take ideas from TED Talks, blogs, books, whoever, whatever, and implement them with fidelity and get a better result. So I will backtrack. There are experts. I was going to say. <laughs> are the leaders who are actually doing the work in schools to make all these crazy ideas that people like me talk about a reality. Now, I did them in some form or another when I was a school leader. That's why I'm here. But context has changed. Technology, technology has changed. And pathways are always going to be different. When you talked about the student with writing, I I feel like there's a thread that I'm catching through multiple podcast episodes. Is this shift away from deficit thinking and just in case teaching uh, towards like a responsiveness and uh, I don't know, an ability to respond to our learners and and see that learning is something that they do for themselves? I don't know. Does that resonate with you at all? Oh, it does, and I would hope that's the case. However. You know, in my role, I have the honor and opportunity to visit thousands of classrooms a year. Mm -hmm. I'm in there with school leaders. We're mm -hmm. looking at practice. We're working on feedback loops, inter-rater reliability. However, more often than not, I see the same thing. All kids doing the same thing at the same time, the same way, which goes mm -hmm. back to first industrial level preparation which in my mind is deficit-minded thinking. These kids got to do all the same thing. If they can't, same way, if they can't do it, then we got to hold them back or we're not successful. But I'm a huge proponent of personalization. And personalization is not putting all kids on a device and having them use it. <laughs> what? <laughs> no? <laughs> Whereas personalization is all learners getting what they need when and where they need it. And that is what I see as the biggest shift that's needed, but also the biggest opportunity for schools. Mm -hmm. And there's not one right way to personalize. However, you need to understand the personal aspect. Are you right. making learning relevant, meaningful, authentic? You know, how are we toning down our direct instruction, our whole group, which is still important, but then allowing our learners to work through tasks at their own pace? with an element of choice aligned mm -hmm. to their own respective path, being able to implement their understanding in various places, whether it's online, outside, flexible seating, and most importantly, are they able to exert their voice? So I, I think when we look at those elements, those help develop these vital competencies that I was referencing before. But if it's not a personalized experience, what often happens is our learners don't see the value in school unless they're just right. conforming. People think that conformity and compliance is engagement. It is not. Hmm. You know, are kids engaged in learning? But then most importantly, how does that engagement lead to ownership? So I think that's the trajectory that we have to ask the right questions. Questions are more important than answers. No one has all the answers. I sure don't. And no one who will get on this podcast or write books has all the answers. We really got to focus on asking the right questions to develop solutions that are going to impact our, well, not just our kids, but our uh, staff as well. And that's what great leaders do. Great leaders ask the right questions. They have no problem saying, I don't know, I need help. And not telling people what to do, but imparting value. So people change, not because they have to, but because they want to. Love it. You get a lot of different tangents out of that question. I know. I, I fired you up a little bit. I like it. Um, I follow you on Twitter. Oh, my gosh. And so it's it's fun to get to chat with you because one of your Twitter posts I really loved. And I, I oh, kept boy. going back okay, to yeah, it. Yeah, I hope it's a good one because you know, sometimes you just never know how they're going to be received. I think this is a good one. I'm going to maybe I'll reshare it when we post this episode. Um, 
but you you talk about shifting our focus and you say we've got to shift from what to who and from traditional to personalized. And you have these really cool ways of representing that. So you've touched on personalized learning, but tell us a little bit more about those shifts. Yeah. You know, often let's think about our experience. Everyone listening to this, close your eyes and think about when you were a student. It was really about, you know, what was taught, what's in the curriculum, mm -hmm. what was on the test, what you need for graduation, promotion. And there were certain content areas where you did not show any interest and you did not care. So that's how traditional learning is. Can I say my favorite quote from Florida Learning? Yes. I grew up in Florida. And when I was learning math, which I was not a fan of, I was told, when dividing fractions, don't ask why, just inverse and multiply. <laughs> don't ask why. Like <laughs> That's like yeah. the epitome of traditional learning to me. Sorry, I interrupted you. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. And I, I think the, the epitome of the shift is moving from the what to who, because that's what emphasizes mm. most. Do we truly understand who we serve? Learners yes. today are not like us when we were learners. Yes, we might have been curious, but they have that access to that information. They have all these games. They can communicate seamlessly. So when we understand who we serve and their needs, then we have to ask ourselves, do learners understand why they're learning what they're learning, how they will use it outside the classroom, and what tells them if they're successful? But personalization doesn't stop with the learners. As leaders, you need to remember who do you serve? You don't just serve students, you serve your staff, you serve your community. And to model a personalized experience, you need to ask, why do I do things the way I do them? How might I do them better? And what tells me if I am successful? If we yes. continue to do what we've always done, will continue to get what we've always gotten. And that what piece is something that I stress in my role as a coach. Don't tell me what you're doing. I want you to show me so that I can unpack the things that you did, the strategies, the methodologies to improve results, both qualitatively and quantitatively, because that's what education wants. They don't want another thing they don't want a fad. They don't want mm. a time sap. They want to know how can I still be successful on assessments like PISA, but still get amazing results where we create a culture where kids love, appreciate, see the value in school, but understand that they are smart. They are geniuses in their own way that might fly in the face with how we were taught or what we think teaching and learning is. I love it because it, I, you brought up the metric, you brought up the PISA test, and that is a reality in schools. And it is, it's one piece of the picture, but it shouldn't be what's driving the entire bus. No, I mean, that's the thing too. It's, you know, it, it's one piece. Notice I did not say it was an invaluable piece. Mm -hmm. I never will say to get rid of any type of standardized assessment because it's one piece of information. Um, but how do we use that one piece of information? I'm more concerned from a leader perspective is what is the role of data in your school, in your organization? How are you using data daily to group, regroup, provide mm -hmm. target instruction to differentiate? How are you using data during professional learning? If you have professional learning communities, how are educators, you know, diving in the data, mm. making decisions on where the gaps are, identifying instructional strategies, implementing those strategies, coming back and determining was there growth? You know, are you implementing common formative assessments, benchmark assessments? So I'm more, and, and that really is also integral to a personalized approach. Data is important. Data yes. is important so that we can use time more effectively with our kids in school to get them what they need. Love it. I love it. Okay. We're going to pivot a bit here because I have you and I 
like I said, you, you are knowledgeable about quite a few topics. And another piece of your work that I found just really captivating is your branded book, right? Um, so give us a little bit of context, branded. What is it all about? Yeah. And you know, everything is adaptable. It comes back to the fact that there's no one right way and mm -hmm. branded is you got to look at it from a hybrid standpoint, depending on what type of school where you lead. So, you know, if you're a public institution, you know, it's really about telling as opposed to selling to build positive relationships. So when we think about the best brands, um, I'm not going to rattle them off, but there are brands that I will spend a lot of money on. Why? Trust, loyalty, dependability. Guess what? That's what your school should provide. Now, in private institutions, you're really employing more of the, the business angle of branding. Yes, you want to build those relationships, mm -hmm. but you also want to give people that inherent sense of, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go apply to the school. I'm, as families, I'm going to spend my money because I know what that return on my investment is going to be. And we could say how great our test scores are, but... A lot of families now, they want and they deserve more. They want to know what are those unique learning experiences? How are you going to prepare kids for a world that is impossible to predict? How will you align to their social emotional needs? Um, what type of extracurricular activities are you going to have that's going to broaden their horizon? What also can they do outside the brick and mortar school? That's going to help them develop these integral competencies. So, you know, but that brand presence only materializes if you are sharing. It comes back to the storytelling piece I mentioned earlier. You know, improve the work, share the work, celebrate the work. Everything mm -hmm. comes back to improving the work in your school. But to build a brand presence in the education world, you got to share and you got to celebrate. Very cool. When, as you were talking, it just made me think about the importance of your values as a school, because that's what you're selling. You're not selling the extracurriculars. That's the what, but you're saying, this is what we value. This is what it looks like. Does this align with what you value? And I think that's the relationship you're trying to form through social media. Would you agree? Yeah. It's, it's that core connection to believe, hmm. you know, uh, in the book, we talk about image promise result. You know, and we often think that the brand is just what we see, the image. You know, when you go to purchase a new computer, you might think Apple might come to mind for a variety of reasons. I love Apple products. I will only buy Apple products um, because I have a reason to believe that it's going to be dependable. It's going to last. Uh, it's innovative company. Mm -hmm. So, but again, looking behind that, it's their messaging. You know, Simon Sinek. Uh, talked about, you know, one of his famous TED Talks, the golden circle. And you can see the imprint of the golden circle and what we talked about before, the, the personalization mm. piece. The only nuance there is the who that we added because we have to always remember the learners we serve. But, you know, everybody knows, and I'm kind of paraphrasing uh, Cynic, everyone knows what they do, but do they knew, know why they do it? and how they do it better than others. And I think that's the key. As leaders, how do you do it better? I work with some countries where they have so many schools that families can choose from. Oh yeah. And there are some countries, there is tons. So if I'm gonna come, okay, I don't care what you do because everyone pretty much does the same thing. Convince me, empower me, impress mm. me, inspire, motivate. What is the compelling why? But how can you show me the intricacies of what you will do and how it help my learners, be, my own two children be successful? Love it. We talked first thing in the conversation about the importance of social media and, and connecting with your audience. So if I'm a leader starting to think about branding, starting to think about the health of my social media accounts. Are there 
things that I can do to kind of assess the health and see kind of where I'm at and if I'm reflecting those values? Yeah. First, use common sense. <laughs> thing targeted on the culture of your school. Right. Uh, don't drink and tweet. Don't post self, uh, questionable selfies. What I'm trying to say, everybody, use common sense. People get in trouble when they overshare their opinions. Opinions mm -hmm. are a dime a dozen. Opinions are what get you in trouble. And what you really want to focus on is, you know, what are the, the cold hard facts of the great things that your students are doing? What, what I did as a principal is I created a brag sheet. And cool. here's the thing we don't do well enough, everybody. We don't brag enough about all the great things that are happening in education. We reside in our silos. We're content and complacent. We are. And that's how things go. But I created a brag sheet because I felt in some cases we were not getting a fair shake in the community or through mm -hmm. national media. And I told my teachers once a month, listen, everybody, I want to know the great things you're doing. I can't, I can't see everything, even though I did five walks a day, my team and I, by the end of the week, we had a hundred data points from our walks a week, but I couldn't be everywhere. And I had them share everything from student achievements, staff accomplishments, innovations, facility updates, guidance, uh, information, athletic, uh, events. Mm -hmm. Uh, extracurriculars. Uh, then I had a category that said other. Oh, I also had professional learning. And what happened was by the end of the month, I had anywhere from five to 20 pages of awesome stuff. Cool. So what I did is I curated it into a report. I had it double proofed. A PDF was created. A link was put on our website. But then I took that link and I pushed it out through our email blast, Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, LinkedIn, uh, our school app. And what I did simply was amplify all the amazing things that my staff was doing. Cool. I also hand delivered a paper copy of that report to all of our trustees so that everybody could see. What I always say, you don't have to be a fan of social media, but you cannot discount the power that it has to get your message across, to create a, the real accurate positive narrative, to build up your staff. But also, don't you want to inspire other schools across the globe? Because that's one thing that I did. And I can say this. You know, my district, my school is outside New York City. New York City is the largest media market in the world. Mm -hmm. Do you think it just ha was by chance that the largest media market in the world, specifically one of our TV stations, CBS, came to my school 14 times in five years to do a wow. positive story on our school? Take your media outlets, everybody. You know how important that is. Why do you think... We were getting more kids back to our school. Why do you think more kids were choosing not to go to the paid private schools? They were choosing to come back because we showed the value and we could mm. not have done that without social media. Okay. Three lightning questions about social media. Cause you're the pro question one, which platforms work best? What should I be on for my school? The, one that, the platform that works best for you in my opinion. Oh, I, I, I listen. <laughs> Um, in my opinion, and I always say this, my job is not to tell people what to do. It's to get you to think about why do you do it that way? How might you do it better? So for me, things change, but I'd say that I always say a multifaceted approach is mm. the best approach. And when you look at traffic right now, you know, I'd say Twitter, uh, LinkedIn and Facebook are the main three because they target different generations. Yeah. So, and you could share the same message across those three platforms. And no Instagram? Use, not Instagram. I'm sorry. LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. But no Instagram because I feel oh, like Instagram no, 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 is kind no, no, of the no, – no, no, no. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Those are more for your text-based responses. 
Mm-hmm. But Instagram was my preferred tool. Everyone thought it was Twitter. Instagram was my preferred tool. Pictures, context, short video clips. So those four in any combination, I'd say, oh. because they target different audiences. More professionals are on LinkedIn. Um, more Generation X and Baby Boomers are on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Uh, Instagram targets everybody. everybody. But the main point is you can take the same message. And there's a tool out there. If it's still in existence, it's called IFTTT. If this, then that. And you can set up recipes. If I post to Facebook, it will then go to Instagram, LinkedIn. So mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it's still operational. So you can, what I'm trying to say is you can streamline your social media strategy. Right. So are you on threads? I am on threads. But is it cool? Well, it was cool to join initially, but now they said that there's less than 200,000 active users. So Yikes. yeah, the, here's the thing. Everyone just chases the next shiny thing and no. comes back. It's no different than Twitter, everybody. Sorry. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Second question. Should I make a social media content calendar or should I post organically? Organically. A calendar. Here's the thing, everybody. If it's important to you, you'll find a way. If not, okay. You will make an excuse. I think it's got to be organic. And my, when I was a principal, I posted at least once a day. What? Now, I'm saying this because you all have to determine what is best for you. So right. I did at least one post a day that went on our Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Same post with a picture, but I did it at least once a day because consistency is what creates value organically. If you're not Mm. consistent, people are not going to follow your accounts. Did you have to blur the kids' faces or did you just get permission from their families to be able to use their image? We had an opt-out form. And basically, every kid opted in when they signed our planner in the beginning of the year so that we only had to deal with a few students that decided to opt out. Smart. Okay. That's a cool way to do it. But yeah, you got to be, have to be cognizant. When I work in schools, I make sure I ask the principals, uh, can I share these pictures? And I always err on the side of caution. I usually take pictures uh, from behind. So you only see the backs of their heads. And I just do that as a courtesy. Cool. Cool. Um, do you suggest letting multiple people post to the school's account, like distributing the responsibility or just having one sole owner of it? I like distributed leadership Mm -hmm. if there's trust. So my answer is if you trust the people, go for it. If not, if you're worried, it's going to come back on you. So you kind of use your best case, best judgment. The other thing I really love from your book, because this, I resonate with this so much is that a big piece of this is moving from being a lurker to a creator, which I love that you use the phrase lurker. So, any advice for those of us who just feel a little more comfortable in the shadows? Yes. Yeah, so here's the thing. It's so funny because usually when I keynote, I, I talk about lurkers. And I said, that's how I first started. When I got on Twitter, I lurked. And I, <laughs> learned, I learned how much I did not know. And then I stared at everyone in the audience and I go, you know what? I'm looking at a whole bunch of creepy people because you lurk just like me. But I go, you want to know the creepiest lurker? My dad. My dad was a school leader for 30 years He has no social media, but he knows everything that's going on because he lurks on my mom's Facebook. (laughs) So what I, what I kind of try to get people to envision is using social media as a choice. So you can choose to be a disconnected leader. That's your choice. However, when you look at options and there isn't a best option, the best option is what works for you. You could be a connected leader. Hmm. You could be a active engager. You could be a willing participant. So I don't care if you lurk and learn. I don't care if you're an active engager, a willing participant, but making the choice not to be a connected leader, in my opinion, my opinion is 
you are just not opening yourself up to an array of strategies, ideas, feedback, mm -hmm. all that stuff that can help you be the best leader for your people. It's a missed opportunity. Oh, yeah, you said it. You summarized it very eloquently. Oh, thank you. That's kind of my job, you know. There you go. Well done. <laughs> okay, two final questions for you. I'm testing these out. So we're going to see how they go. But I really want to have like a graphic that comes in that goes, aha moment. And I've heard one of your aha moments before when the kid was like, school's like a prison. I'm curious, since then, what has been the biggest aha moment of your career? To stop focusing on the yeah buts and put my energy into the what ifs. Ooh, I like that. You want to elaborate yeah. or you just want to? Oh, I can elaborate. It? Think about it. We all have our yeah buts. Yeah, but Eric, not enough time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but too many mandates and directives. Yeah, but not enough money. Guess what? I had all those challenges. I had all the challenges and more. So we focus so much on agonizing over what we cannot control instead of putting our time and effort in those things that we can control. And that's where the what ifs lie. You know, what if... I, you know, we build academy programs to bring our learners back, to give them purpose, to have them go through personalization so that they're not making these other choices and they're coming to our school. You know, what if I take my communications, condense them, put it on social media so I get the message across to more people? Right. What if we critically evaluate our professional learning and move away from being developed I don't like the term professional development because nobody really wants to be developed to professional learning, something that as adults that we want to do because we see the inherent value in it. So that would be one of my, my biggest aha moments. And that really is a mindset shift, I think. Love it. Okay. This last question, you seem like a fun guy. So can I see your best superhero pose real fast? Hmm. Best superhero pose. I guess I'll have to go like this. I love it. Okay. So it, since you're feeling like a superhero, what is your superpower? Like, what is it that makes you just like awesome? Well, I don't know if it makes me awesome, but I think one of my superpowers is reflection. And I'm constantly trying to get better. And you can't get better if you don't reflect. Whether I speak, and a lot of times I take reflect, I, I reflect by just reading the body language of my audience. Mm. Or if I really screw up, and I do screw up sometimes, I'm human. And if I say something the wrong way or, or rub a leader the wrong way when I provide feedback, I make sure I don't make the same mistake twice. Nice. So I, I think reflection is something we want our students to do every day. But how do we make the time both personally and professionally to reflect in order to grow? I adore it. Well, Eric, it was so fun to meet you. And just, I think you're just a, a very fun guy. I think you're really knowledgeable. And I think any school would be really lucky to have you come in. I think there'd be a lot of aha moments. Yeah, I mean, that's what I hope. And, you know, I, I love, love doing this work. I love being able to work with leaders and bask in their glory because it's all about shared success. So you don't get much gratification from a key keynote. Now, granted, I love doing them, but it's being able to see how people take those ideas, implement them with fidelity and get better results. And that's something that I just love doing with leaders across the world. Well, clearly it lights you up. So thanks for sharing with us today. My pleasure. <music> Thank you.